Thank you. Thank you for that uh, lovely introduction. And it's nice to know that here as well, there are backbenchers. So uh, can you hear me okay? Because I'm not mic'd. All right, great. So thank you. As Fumia said, this is an extension of some of my uh, recent research uh, that came out. I, I had a couple of articles on STEM come out uh, like a week or two ago. And so I've been pivoting to kind of find something new to present to you so that you can give me some feedback on my research because what good is it to present work that is already published? So as Fumia said, for the past 10 to 15 years, I've been exploring women's underrepresentation in STEM fields science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, because it allows me to combine my interest in occupational attainment with my knowledge of family demography. Contemporary debates about STEM education and the STEM labor force often center around two disparate claims. The first is that there's a shortage of trained workers for the scientific and technical needs of employees, employers, and that this shortage could be ameliorated if we could just get larger numbers of women and minorities to train in STEM disciplines where they're currently underrepresented. The second claim, which I think uh, Yushia is more in support of, uh, is that there is no shortage, but rather a problem of retention in STEM occupations. Numerous initiatives supported by various federal investments have sought to increase the presence of women and minorities in STEM and working in the STEM workforce Less has been done to address uh, attrition and retention issues. So where's my little clicker? There is good news uh, and notable advances in addressing the shortage of uh, women uh, training in STEM fields. Women's graduation rates have increased substantially over the last few decades. At Cornell, I uh, constantly hear about how the incoming class of engineering students is about half women at the moment. And nationally, we've seen sharp increases in the, in the shares of bachelor's degrees in science and engineering that are awarded to women. So in 2020, women received half of all bachelor's degrees in uh, these fields, and this pattern's held consistent for about the past decade. Furthermore, women who graduate with degrees in STEM are as likely as their male counterparts to enter into STEM jobs for the most part. Computer science is a, a stubborn exception to this, but I'm not talking about computer science today. So in other words, there are more women taking STEM classes and majoring in STEM fields, graduating with STEM degrees, and entering into STEM occupations following uh, college graduation. Yet, women's representation in the STEM workforce lags their educational gains. As of 2021, women accounted for only 35% of the STEM workforce. Furthermore, women are concentrated in STEM occupations with lower average wages, the life sciences rather than engineering. STEM fields such as engineering and computer science and, uh, have been particularly slow to change. Furthermore, there's evidence that even when women obtain degrees in engineering and computer science and enter into related jobs, they often do not remain in those jobs, thereby affecting the overall composition of the STEM workforce. One reason this uh, shortage of women in STEM fields is important is that women's underrepresentation, particularly in these high paying jobs like computer science and engineering helps perpetuate the gender wage gap. So why given a few decades of interest in increasing women's representation in STEM fields, do we continue to see this uh, shortage of women in STEM? There are a few explanations that are generally offered to account for the dearth of women. And so the first standard explanation centers on women's family roles and gendered expectations regarding care work. Women are more likely to take on greater shares of house, uh, housework and childcare than their male counterparts when they're in relationships, for example. So uh, some of my research uh, in cohabitation and union formation or marriage uh, has uh, referenced uh, Sanjeev Gupta's work from the NSFH that finds that when women enter into cohabitating relationships or marriage, they begin to do more housework, whereas uh, men, when they enter into these unions, do less. <laughs> women also spend more time than men caring for children. And for those in professional occupations, intensive parenting expectations weigh more heavily on mothers than on fathers. Yeah, this explanation may have less weight now and particularly among younger cohorts than it did among previous ones. 
For one thing, most college educated adults do not marry and begin childbearing until their 30s, leaving them with a decade or so to invest in the labor market. Furthermore, a growing uh, body of research has found that professional women are increasingly experiencing a marriage and parenthood premium. While it is not as large as that experienced by men, it suggests that there are growing incentives for women to remain in the paid labor force, even after assuming family roles. Okay, so we then come to a second explanation for why women leave the STEM workforce, and this one revolves around the challenges of being in an unfriendly work climate. Uh, this is a cover from the Atlantic uh, magazine, and it has Shelley Carell in the corner. Uh, many engineering and technology companies are described as being hard places for women to uh, work. Women often report that the workplace climate is unfriendly, that they feel isolated and unwelcome given the low representation of women, and their scarcity makes everyday interactions fraught. Some describe work cultures that are very aggressive and competitive as toxic. Furthermore, uh, whereas women with STEM degrees express more liberal views regarding gender, their male counterparts often adhere to far more traditional views of women's roles, making it difficult to work side by side. Assessing how workplace culture shapes women's retention in STEM, however, has been challenging. And a third explanation, one with backing from a growing body of evidence from sociology, psychology, and economics, has suggested that bias plays a role in perpetuating the shortage of women in STEM occupations. Women appear to be devalued in fields that are male dominant. This gender penalty has been documented at various career stages, several of which I've been uh, working on exploring. Uh, so it could be from the transition from getting your degree into the workforce uh, through the early and mid career. So for example, audit studies have shown that applications to work in a research lab are assessed differently depending on whether the applicant is named Jennifer or Jack. Both male and female supervisors are less likely to want to hire, mentor, or promote Jennifer, even though her resume is identical, because it's an audit study, to Jack's. Employers also feel justified in offering lower starting salaries to Gen uh, Jennifer's than to Jack's, uh, even though their skills are identical. Um, other research by Natasha Quadlin and her colleagues has found that men in STEM fields receive an earnings boost from attending a selective college, though women whose STEM degrees are from selective universities don't experience the same wage premium. This might be due to implicit biases. Women in STEM jobs are often assumed to be less competent and less, com uh, less competent and committed than their male counterparts. And uh, finally, various studies show that women are more likely than men to leave jobs in STEM. They are not leaving the labor force, they are moving into other non-STEM jobs. They also seem to do so early in their careers, uh, so some uh, often within the first decade. And that's not to say that men don't also leave STEM jobs, uh, but they don't leave them as rapidly as women do. Research by Jennifer Hunt on engineers finds that such exits are the result of dissatisfaction with pay and promotion. So additional research looking at both employment and pay has found that the gender gaps are due to women receiving different returns to their characteristics than men. So still, these are um, most of these findings are based on quantitative studies. They're somewhat limited in informing us about the reasons as to why and when attrition from STEM fields occurs. Many of these data sources uh, used to understand this are not longitudinal, uh, or do not adequately capture what goes on in the early career to shape subsequent work trajectories. To better understand what happens uh, in the early uh, career trajectories, about 10 years ago, along with my co-author Jennifer Glass at UT Austin, I began a mixed methods study uh, with a focus on the early career experiences of recent STEM graduates from college. We hope to learn more about whether women and minorities remained in STEM jobs. The existing studies told us that there is attrition, but not what the processes were that contributed to the steady leakage of women and minorities from the STEM labor force. So this is a two phase uh, mixed methods uh, project. In the spring of 2015 and 2016, we surveyed majors graduating with degrees in two fields, chemical engineering and chemistry. 
Uh, and we uh, turn to our colleagues in our respective universities to provide us with the list of graduating seniors and graduating uh, graduate students. And then we tracked them down four years later and uh, re-surveyed our initial respondents. So we have a five-year uh, time frame. We also selected a subsample of respondents from each school and conducted in-depth interviews with them yearly. So we started out with about a, a sample size of 100. Um, and then my last, my last interviews were conducted in the spring of uh, 2020. So during COVID, when I was on sabbatical, um, I Zoomed with respondents and uh, these respondents have been out of uh, college for four to five years. And we talked about uh, their work during COVID, but also uh, what had happened in the uh, previous uh, year. So we did yearly interviews with these respondents and the questionnaire changed each year as respondents moved in and out of rotations or changed jobs uh, and rethought their goals regarding uh, their careers. So why chemical engineering and chemistry? Uh, there are other majors like computer science that I've also studied that are much hotter job markets. But among the reasons that we uh, chose these two majors is that both have relatively large shares of women undergraduates relative to other engineering majors or uh, other majors in the physical sciences. So in 2015, women received uh, almost a third of all bachelor's degrees awarded in chemical engineering. And this share is much greater than you uh, see happening in mechanical engineering or electrical engineering. Um, and the same can be said for uh, chemistry. Chemical engineering also has a robust job market for graduate students with just a bachelor's. Uh, one doesn't have to go to graduate school uh, in order to earn a nice salary. And that's reflected in the earnings of uh, my respondents that I interviewed. One to three years out of college, most of our respondents working in the labor force were earning between seventy dollars to $115,000. So this is just with a bachelor's degree. Don't know whether you think that's high or not, but um, it's higher than many starting assistant professors in sociology in non-selective universities. Okay, so I'm going to fly through my findings from the, uh, we did two quantitative studies uh, using the survey data to think about uh, whether uh, respondents had jobs uh, as of spring of their senior year, and then whether they were still in STEM uh, jobs five years later, but I'm mostly going to focus on my qualitative work. So I just want to give you uh, the uh, survey results. And it's pretty good news, uh, and it was not what we expected. So my previous research on STEM graduates using data from my cohort, the NLSY79, uh, found no gender difference in transitions into STEM jobs, um, but we also found that substantial proportions of women who took STEM jobs left them, left the labor force for other uh, jobs, and did so relatively rapidly. But these results are somewhat different uh, so we found that women were more likely to have a job offer by spring of their senior year, but that this gender advantage disappeared once we controlled for other things uh, like uh, their GPA and the number of internships or the quality of internships that they had. We also note that the quality of internships uh, was somewhat different for the women and men, and that mattered for transitions into jobs. And I have a separate paper, a qualitative paper that explores that, um, but uh, I'm not going to, uh, this is basically uh, kind of no gender difference. And then uh, in a second paper, which is currently under review, we assess whether those who obtained a job in STEM uh, uh, were working in a STEM job uh, four years later, five years later. And uh, we found that the vast majority were still, uh, were, were working in STEM jobs. So if they didn't start out in STEM, they didn't really enter into it, but 85% uh, of our sample was employed in STEM. So attrition looked to be relatively uncommon early in the career stage and their early career experiences must have provided enough re rewards for them to remain in these jobs. So this is really good news. <laughs> Disappointing for me, because I didn't expect this. Uh, and so I didn't really believe it. Uh, so this is a pretty small slice of time. Um, uh, so because I've been working uh, with uh, data from the NSF Scientist and Engineering Engineer Statistical Data System, or CSTAT data, I looked at that data for chemical engineers to see if what we were finding was due to the recency of these graduates and stopping the clock too early. And the answer is yes, right? So what I'm showing here 
is a graph of those graduating with degrees in chemical engineering by graduation cohort. So on the bottom, you'll see 2000. These are people who graduated from 2000 to 2009, and then the previous uh, decade of graduates, and then the ones prior. Um, and what you can see is that there is a decline across cohorts in the proportions of those with chemical engineering degrees who are working in STEM jobs, whether those are chemical engineering or a related STEM job. Uh, so you can see that in the blue and orange bars, uh, those represent STEM jobs. For men, there is a slight change in the share who are working, say, working outside of STEM, right? Um, but uh, for women, the proportion not working in STEM e increases by graduation co cohort to a much greater extent than STEM than for men. So I think we would find more attrition if we had uh, more than a five-year sample. Um, and uh, it would probably be gendered with more attrition among women than men. So for the remainder of my talk, I'm going to shift gears and uh, focus on how these respondents describe their early career experiences in the first three to four years of uh, their uh, being out of college. So think back to your early post-college years and all those interesting transitions. Um, and I'm also going to concentrate exclusively on the chemical engineering graduates, given that they had a much more specific job market available to them than those with degrees in chemistry. And what I'm looking at in particular are the work hours that the respondents describe and how they change over time. So here are my uh, guiding questions. So first I wanna know how do recent graduates in chemical engineering describe their work hours in the early career? What do they think about their jobs and how much time they're putting in? How do their hours change over time? And how do our respondents view these changes? Do their, uh, do their responses to changing work hours challenge or reify long work hour ex expectations? Are they pushing back against the greedy workplace or are they accepting these long work hours without question? So I'm still at a very early stage of this research. Yeah, this is like the last two weekends. <laughs> Sorry, it's a very busy time of the semester, but I've been rereading uh, these transcripts for a few years. And one theme that keeps jumping out to me is that as how the respondents in my sample talk about the hours that they work. And this resonates with me in particular because um, I hear this a lot from my students, my current undergraduates, juniors and seniors in my uh, work and family class, who strongly believe that they'll be working 60 hour weeks after they graduate. And I'm really curious as to how these such a work ethos develops, right? Um, these conversations often remind me of Paul Willis's book, Learning to Labor, how working class kids get working class jobs, but it's focused on, you know, those in selective universities and not working class kids. So I am curious about whether my students and my interview respondents really want to put in 60 hour weeks, right? Why do they want to work that long? Are they simply following their parents' footsteps or is this culture developed in selective universities and particular work sites? So I'm going to focus my uh, talk on the work sites, but if any students here wanna do research on understanding how these long work hour expectations are inculcated among students, go ahead. I'm happy to talk with you more about that. I'm also interested in the work hours because uh, we've been hearing various stories about employers and um, who insist about their, their employees working long uh, work hours. So when Elon Musk took over Twitter, for example, he threatened to fire those who would not put in 80 hour weeks, right? And how many of you recall that picture of that one woman sleeping under her work desk who then got fired anyway, right? So this says something about long work hours and loyalty. But we've also been hearing recently as the auto workers began to strike ab about what many thought of as an unrealistic demand. Uh, a 32 hour work week. Uh, granted, this was part of a bargaining process and it was not something that the auto workers actually got in the recent uh, agreement, uh, but it did draw the attention of many to what could be a four day work week, right? And uh, this is something that has been trialed in various companies. Uh, so uh, Phyllis Moen has a book uh, on overwork that was trialed in, I believe it was Best Buy and in other countries where there is, uh, they're floating the idea of a four day week, work week. 
And this is, comes also in conjunction with um, a lot of discussion about Gen Z and their work uh, at attitudes. So there's been a proliferation of terms used to label workers, such as a quiet, uh, those who opt out of the rat race that is the professional career. So we have chilling or lying flat. We have quiet quitting. And my least favorite term, lazy girl jobs. Right. So we hear a lot about work hours. Um, uh, but, uh, what is, what is overwork? That's my next slide. All right. So sociologists, uh, define overwork as working 50 or more hours per week. Right. And since the late 20th century, there's been an increase in the percentage of all Americans who work more than 50 hours a week. The last major overhaul of U.S. labor uh, protections occurred under Franklin uh, Delano Roosevelt with the 1938 Fair Labor Standards Act, FLSA, uh, that established the 40-hour week and overtime pay premiums for hourly workers who were the bulk of the labor force at that time. Since then, we've seen the rapid growth of professional and managerial jobs that were specifically exempt from the uh, FLSA, as well as the reclassification of many hourly workers as salaried to avoid compliance with overtime uh, hours. So long work hours are now a hallmark of professional jobs in the United States. And uh, this problem has accelerated since the 1970s as competition for advancement has intensified. My colleague Kim Whedon has several papers that explore the impact of overwork and sent me this week an update of the trends of the proportions of Americans who worked 50 or more hours a week. So if you can see this mini, mini graph on the bottom, what it shows is that, that the shares of those overworking rose in the 1980s, peaking in 1999, and have actually declined since then. So as of 2019, uh, men were uh, twice as likely to be overworking as women so it's about 15, it's 15.6% 15 for men and 17% 7 for women. Um, uh, but these are all workers, not just professional workers, right? And more specifically, those studying the professional work sites argue that long work hours have become embedded in workplace practices, cultures, and beliefs about what it means to be an ideal worker. So how does this process emerge? This is what I'm uh, interested in studying. So let me introduce you to my sample, right? So uh, I initially had 51 uh, recent graduates with degrees in chemical engineering, but over time we experienced a little bit of attrition, generally of those working long hours. And so I am left uh, in year three and four with 45 respondents who had been interviewed annually since they graduated. Um, and uh, our respondents are pretty balanced by sex because we oversampled for women as well as uh, minorities. So we also have an overrepresentation of uh, Black and Hispanic chemical engineering graduates, but they're more Hispanic than African American, largely because one of our uh, selection sites was uh, UT Austin, right? Um, almost all of our interview respondents were working in STEM fields uh, when they were interviewed, though not all were in chemical engineering. So we have one female respondent who went off to investment banking. Whenever I give a STEM talk, people always ask me, what about those who go to Wall Street? And we really didn't, you know, there's one person here. Um, and there was one woman who had not yet found a job uh, at the time of her first interview. We also have a large number of graduate students uh, in our sample, more from Cornell than from UT and more male than female. So the graduate students pursuing degrees uh, in chemical engineering or medicine in our sample were disproportionately male. And that shapes our findings about work hours as I'm sure the graduate students will know because they're, they tell me here that they put in long work hours, right? So let me show you where uh, the kind of industries where our uh, people are working. Um, uh, as you might expect, uh, given that it's chemical engineering, the largest proportion are working in energy related fields as production or process engineers. Um, and this includes graduates from both schools, not just the Texas school, right? Um, we also have the next most common industry was to work for a chemical company, a handful work for beverage companies. So I don't know if you know this, but working in beer breweries is apparently a really big thing for people with degrees in chemical engineering. Uh, and if you described working in the wine industry as well, fluids, I guess, right? Mm -hmm. 
Um, and then we have those working for pharmaceuticals, right? Um, so I'm going to pivot to talking about their description of the uh, first year on the job and then transition later. Um, so when they described their first year on the job, our recent college graduates were a little shell-shocked about what this experience was like. Transitions into the world of work often required major adjustments. Instead of the demands of classes, labs, and papers, the professional work world generally required more concentrated effort and often mandated being at one location for long periods of time. So several of our respondents commented on how difficult this transition from school to work actually was, in part because they found the work life to be exhausting, right? So many of us agree with this, it's exhausting, right? Um, but as of their first year, uh, over half of them were working regular work weeks. So they worked 40 to 45 hours or they experienced mild variation. Uh, in these hours, right? So most in this group mentioned that they generally left by 6 p.m. and worked pretty standard hours, um, often because of workplace policies that limited them, right? So some of them had a check-in, uh, they had a punch card. Um, and Lily here, uh, who's a tech service engineer, uh, says, I don't really have to work any overtime or really put in a lot of hours at home. She thinks she might in the future, but she hasn't as of her first year. It's a pretty standard day. And then uh, Sarah, who landed a very cushy job in a government uh, lab that she really loves, talks about how standard her work week is and that she's got what's called a 980. So you put in 80 hours of work uh, over two weeks, but you can work nine hours a day instead of eight, uh, along with your lunch, uh, and you can take every other Friday off. And this was a pretty standard uh, kind of work week for many of our respondents. So we're going to hear more about the 980s in a little bit. But she was limited to 40 hours, right? And her supervisor made sure she didn't go over. And part of learning to labor was learning how to get what you needed to get done in 40 hours. However, a third of our respondents were actually uh, overworking. Um, so they worked 50 more hour or more hours a week, or they experienced extreme variability in their work hours. And in the first year, we found that this was much more prevalent among men than among women. Um, so, um, uh, where am I? All right. So, um, George, who was working at a startup, uh, as he was applying to medical school was working long hours and said that he found the work exciting and he was very willing to stay uh, late and do the extra. But I wanted to put the quote from Maria here. She is representative of many of those working long hours, but she's a bit different because she's in investment banking. And she describes an absolutely crazy day of uh, 15 hours a day, which she thinks is good, right? Because some days I don't work 15 hours a day and then I come in on weekends, right? Um, but she mentions that she thrives at this job more than a typical engineering role. So she likes it. She thinks it's fast paced and exciting. Um, and she's fine with it, at least initially. Right. Women were, as I said, men were more likely to be in the overwork categories, but women more often reported that they had jobs with extreme variability, uh, like uh, Marcy here who uh, had a rotation job. So she worked like three jobs, three different jobs in her first year. Um, and usually uh, it was a regular hour, but during harvest season, she had to supervise what was happening with the harvest. And so she worked 72 hours a week for three months, right? Which is, you know, I, I don't think I could manage that. Um, and then uh, this is another kind of schedule mentioned by uh, Will who was doing a rotation where he was on an oil rig. And so he spent 14 days on and 14 days off. And those 14 days were 12 hour days. So this could also be considered extreme variability. But how do they feel about their uh, work days um, during their first year? Oftentimes those who uh, had 40 hours a week only were not as interested in what they were doing and they were kind of bored. Right. Um, those who uh, were doing overwork uh, felt more uh, charged up about their work and more interested. So uh, Chen is a graduate student in chemical engineering who was working 50 or more hours a week. And he said, I'm having fun. I'm not complaining about it. So think back to the excitement of your first year of graduate school. <laughs> 
But I noticed that men and women express somewhat different uh, experiences of how the first year uh, operated when they were working regular hours. And this is part of the gender story. So women more often talked about not having enough to do and having to go around and ask people for work, right? Um, and so it seemed like they were either not seen, they weren't being handed up enough work. Maybe they didn't trust their skills yet. But the men actually talked about uh, work somewhat differently. It wasn't that they didn't have enough work. It's that they wanted more responsibility, right? So they wanted to be running the shop already. Um, so Jerry here talks about the stuff they give me is very simple stuff and I'm just helping out. So the responsibility level is not really there. And I read a lot about this. I am also hearing about how the women uh, frequently mention wanting more technical work. And instead, they're given more like administrative work. So this is also another a through line that I need to follow up because it suggests that they're being tracked into somewhat different jobs. And the women are dissatisfied uh, with not with not having technical jobs. There's one woman who said something like, I don't like people very much. So she didn't know why she was always in forward facing jobs when she, what she wanted to be doing is running calculations. So what happened over time? Now, qualitative people hate when I do this, but I'm going to show you, uh, it's like sequence analysis. Think of it as sequence analysis, right? So we are looking at transitions over time. And if you uh, think of this going clockwise, uh, we can think about how uh, over time they shift into working uh, more long hours. And by their third interview, over half of our respondents were engaged in long work hours. Right. So um, we can see uh, that the largest number of respondents, that's this 18, if we're going clockwise, are still working in regular hour jobs, so 40 to 45 hours a week. Um, but if we move to the right, and that's a 10 who used to work regular hours, who shifted into long work hours, and then dropping down, we see that 13 have been working long hours uh, all the whole time they were in the labor force. And then we only have four who transitioned from really long work hours to shorter hours, right? And in part, two of them did that because they, they changed jobs to get away from the high variability, including Marcy, who left her job for uh, the wine company. The two men in that category uh, transitioned to graduate school, and apparently the first year of graduate school had less hours than their previous one, right? So how did they feel about their work hours? Well, there was a lot of heterogeneity in these views, um, and so most of our respondents accepted their long work hours, although we have a few who mentioned burnout. A very few <laughs> want longer hours, but we do see some pushback against these long uh, work hours with attempts to scale back or suggesting to bosses that uh, there are other ways to think about the work world. And women were more often found in this group that was trying to scale back or suggesting new ways. So I'm gonna walk through some of their quotes, mm -hmm. right? So uh, accepting long work hours uh, uh, was, pretty standard among those who uh, were working regular hours, or, sorry, they were fine. Those working regular hours were fine with their regular hours, right? So Sarah, who had the sweet government job, is doesn't want to have a job where she's working longer hours. And she started a master's program, which she can do because she can leave the workplace uh, at five. But most of those who were working long hours accepted that their hours were long. And so this was I've separated out the graduate students from the other workers. Um, so the graduate student, in part because we have 10 graduate students in the sample of 45 and working long hours among graduate students kind of drives our findings, but they're very realistic in that they want to finish. And uh, if they're not working long hours in the lab, they think it will drag out their degree. And as Daphne says, productivity would be way too low or Tyler, who made a pivot in his second year of graduate school to a new topic and really feels the need to get on top of uh, uh, his project so that he can get closer to graduating, right? So graduate students are a bit different, maybe. Um, what about those who are in uh, the workforce? Well, many of them seem to appreciate that they're doing work that matters. So Alexis was someone who didn't have enough work previously, but now she's feeling like she definitely earns her paycheck. 
Uh, so she earns it by putting in another 10 hours a week and maybe earning less hourly, but she's feeling good about it. And others kind of accept that it comes uh, with the territory. So Phil uh, was talking about a turnaround, which is when you go into oil tanks and you clean them out and it's an onerous, really long process. And so he talks about how it's uh, a lot of work. It's 13 hour days. Um, and it's not work that a lot of want, a lot of people want to do. So it's young people, he said, recent college graduates who do it. But he thinks it's OK because he gets paid a lot. Uh, that's how it goes. Right. Um, th so those are two reasons that they like the responsibility. They get paid a lot. But others accept the long work hours because they're getting a lot of pressure from their uh, co-workers. Right. So. Uh, Ethan is on a what's a, called a 410 schedule. So they work four 10 hour days and they're supposed to have every Friday off. But his boss doesn't like it when people aren't there on Fridays, even though they're not supposed to be there on Fridays. So he's getting workplace pressure to come in on one of his days off. Right. And then Nancy, uh, oops, I should probably not note that she works for Exxon. I got to take that out. But she resents the fact that she's getting all this pressure. Uh, to work long hours, even though, you know, she's salaried, she's not getting more money if she puts in more time. Um, but if she only clocked a 40 hour week, um, they would like shake their head and say, Nancy, you're not pulling your weight. Right. So there is an awful lot of pressure for them to uh, work long hours, whether they want to or not, right, in order to be taken seriously as professionals. So I mentioned that there were some who wanted longer hours. Yes, like hit me, give me some more. And who are they? Well, some of them are our graduate students, right? Who want long hours in part because they feel like if they spend more and more time in the lab, a light bulb will go off and they'll have a brilliant idea, right? So Chen had actually cut back the number of work hours he was doing when he got married. Uh, but then after a while, he started going back to the lab late at night and he thinks that ideas are really important for PhDs and he doesn't want to be limited in terms of time he spends to think about ideas. So graduate school, he thinks, is the time to really burn the midnight oil, right? And then I have a worker here who has been putting in 60-hour uh, weeks who, who talks about it as an investment in her future. Um, but this is also a limited investment because if she doesn't feel like she's going to be rewarded, she's not going to Put the hours in, but it's too late at that point. She's already spent a year working very long hours. Um, so uh, there are only about six in this category who want to work long hours, and some were used to long hours and then uh, were in the first year of graduate school thinking they were going to work more time. But um, there are those who still want more time, who want to work more time. And then there, uh, there is a share who are uh, wanting to change. So we have a few who are ready to scale back, um, but they haven't done so yet. Um, so uh, Maria, who is our investment bank banker, uh, who initially thought she was just going to push through and get the great training and kind of go survival mode for a little bit. But she is rethinking uh, this option because she wants to think, figure out what she actually wants for her life and her career down the line. And we do hear um, a number of people who talk about how they don't want to go into mid middle management at this point because of the work hours and the pressure. So they're reassessing things, but it does uh, seem to be more of the women who are sensitive to these work hours uh, than the men. Now, what about those who actually uh, push back against long uh, work hours? Uh, we do have about a quarter of our people who are uh, attempting to uh, push back against this structure. Um, many of those who are working regular hours thought they could work even less and still get the work done because of technology, right? Um, but others uh, were actually agentic and suggested ways of changing the long work hour culture. And others realized that they weren't going to get anywhere by uh, suggesting to their bosses that they scale back. So they try to trick the system, right? And maybe this is quiet quitting. I'm not totally sure what quiet quitting is, right? And again, women are better represented among those who are challenging or pushing back or uh, trying to bound their work hours. So uh, I, I get a kick out of these who needs a 40-hour work week respondents. So I'm showing you a few of them. 
Um, but they basically think that, you know, the 40 hour work week is just a little bit excessive, right? Um, because of technology. So they don't think we should need as many as hours in the office um, because you are not productive for that whole time, right? And uh, our second respondent uh, talks about what she actually does in the workforce, right? So she may work for 30 hours a week, but the other time I'm socializing or waiting for work or sleeping in my office, right? So um, maybe she has never been given real work or maybe she's uh, not uh, not all that interested in, in what she's doing. Um, but we also have men saying that they don't think that uh, longer work hours would really achieve anything. What, what uh, struck me though were the few respondents who did try to suggest that their workplace shift to a different kind of structure with regards to hours. And uh, so both uh, these two women suggested that their companies move to a 980 schedule. Um, and Lynn here, you know, thinks it's a matter of course for her to kind of suggest ways to improve the work-life experience for herself and her colleagues. But she also nests this in how common a 980 schedule is in this work uh, air, in this uh, field, right? Not necessarily where she's located, but uh, she wants a, a 980. She explains what it is. She says it's really common in the chemical industry, especially in the Gulf Coast where I'm from. Both my parents worked it, all my friends work it. And so she suggests that because they're already working that schedule, they should also try to implement it at her work site. Um, but she doesn't realize that they already work it, but they're also working that extra Friday. So they're contributing more time. But she does suggest it to her boss. And then it's supposed to go up the hierarchy and uh, let, uh, you know, I'm not holding my breath. Right. So then there are others who start leaving early, make appointments. Uh, we faculty try to do this too, block things out on our time frame so that you're not there endlessly. Um, so I'm just gonna, I'm wrapping up really. <laughs> um, where am I? Okay, I am at my conclusion. All right. Um, okay, so, um, so we see over time that uh, there is this shift to working long hours in uh, the STEM labor force uh, for many of our respondents and that there's a considerable amount of pressure uh, to do so, right? So, um, and the processes that contribute to this um, are in some ways embedded in the system. There are um, uh, long hour demands to make it through a graduate program in a consistent amount of time to uh, uh, to, to complete. Um, and perhaps partially as a result of uh, graduate, the, the gendered nature of the those who were pursuing graduate school, we see that men were more likely to engage in overwork, right? Um, but they also were more likely to engage in overwork in their very first job. And it took women, to, uh, women had to catch up to them in terms of overwork. How does the process of learning to overwork unfold? Uh, these findings suggest that many early career professionals in STEM accept that long work hours are the norm, right? While a handful suggest uh, ways that they might reduce the work week by working 980s or 410s, uh, which many in the oil or chemical industry are familiar with, even when such systems exist, our workers often mention that they're still expected to come into work. So we might set up these structures but then uh, employers have to adhere to them and ensure that workers weren't uh, coming into work. So enacting these systems might not actually reduce work hours that much without that level of support. Uh, furthermore, it's unclear how workers who suggest these uh, changes will be judged by the powers that be. They might be labeled as being less committed workers for suggesting these changes. Will they be passed over for promotion or choose not to seek them because of the long work hour expectations? So we've not followed them long enough uh, to know the answer to this. We have interviews through year five, at which point uh, I, I, can't, I can't attest to uh, where they are in the workforce. But what we do see is that more workers mention being pressured to work longer hours uh, than there are those who suggest that they are going to be working fewer hours or trying to attain some balance. Um, so some of those who are working these long hours are contemplating changing jobs or setting boundaries. 
Um, but the likelihood is that they'll still continue to see these expectations for long work hours in their next professional job. The results also suggest evidence of gender disparities in the early career process from the kinds of work they're given early on uh, to how well they're able to utilize their technical skills. By their third year, women have caught up with men in terms of working uh, long hours, but they are expressing dissatisfaction with these long work hours more than their male counterparts. Of note is that these attempts to address overwork and dissatisfaction with long hours are emerging well before family formation processes. So the our argument that it's because of family, uh, we're not really finding support for. Uh, some of my respondents mentioned that they would like to work fewer hours when they have families, but uh, families are well in the distance for them. They are future aspiration. Uh, so in a paper I presented at the ASA, looking at the five-year data from our respondents and their family goals, uh, most were still talking about having kids out in their 30s. So at this point, they're in their mid-20s. So it appears that work hours may play a larger role in shaping women's retention in STEM in the early career than, say, their views of family. Of course, this study has many shortcomings. It's a small qualitative sample and our respondents do end up pursuing a wide array of occupations, which is kind of a challenge. Um, furthermore, our respondents are not representative of all of those who graduate with degrees in chemical engineering because they're from two very well-known training programs for chemical engineering. And so we would expect them to be more likely to engage in these professions that have overwork and finally, it's very early in their career. It's the first three to four years of their career. While these years are demographically dense with new jobs, possible relationships, marriage, and children, our, our respondents are not yet in the thick of that. So we have uh, relatively few who are married and only one who is a mother who was a mother when she was in university. Um, still, I think these results provide a nice window into why it's been so challenging to retain women in STEM fields. Overwork seems to be playing an important role in conditioning how young professionals view their career trajectories. So my last slide, are today's millennials going to save us from karoshi, the Japanese term for death by overwork? <laughs> um, this is a, head, uh, a, a picture from the New York Times story uh, published in 2019 that suggested that Gen Z would refuse to work the long hours as uh, like previous generations had done. And the verdict is yet out, but uh, I hope you'll excuse me if I seem doubtful that the youngest workers, those with the least amount of uh, power in the labor market will be able to make that change. That would require a broader discussion of the institutional incentives supporting long work hours, the challenges they pose for family formation and stability, and the impact they have on perpetuating uh, gender inequality, both in specific occupational fields like chemical engineering and STEM fields more broadly, uh, and in the broader labor market overall. Thank you.